even though this is the quantum mechanics session in the broad sense, this will have nothing to do with quantum mechanics. I wanted to talk about the dimensionless constants of, of nature and um, what they might tell us. We have, uh, of course, our standard model Lagrangian. It's very successful. <laughs> if you have very good eyesight and read the fine print, you'll see there are a lot of little dimensionless constants in there. In, in a recent paper, Anthony and I and more recent Frank Lucek counted them up and made this table. You need 26 dimensionless constants to do all the particle physics, and for another five or six more, you can do the universe too, do cosmology. And uh, when you stare at these numbers, there are a couple of very obvious questions, I think, jump to jump at you. First of all, how would you measure them? And we know how to measure most of them. And then why do they have those values? And more generally, you know, what do these numbers actually tell us? We have um, had a fair bit of discussion here informally about what they tell us. Many of them look a bit like random numbers. We used to hope this holy grail of theoretical physics that one of you would come up with a great equation and you would just calculate all of the numbers from first principles. Uh, Ed Whitten even told me he was pretty optimistic about that back in uh, 1996 when I asked him. And then when I asked him again last year at Andre Linde's birthday party and he had some wine, he basically backed off from that. And many of you have sort of grudgingly perhaps conceded that maybe we won't be able to calculate them all, but maybe we can at least reduce the number of parameters or find some more relations between them. That would be great. Now, I want to say two things. First of all, if you think something looks kind of random, you can ask, is there some regularity in the randomness? Do they at least obey maybe a simple probability distribution which has fewer parameters? We can test for that hypothesis, right? And, and and lo and behold, actually, there does seem to be some regularities of that type, which I find really quite striking. Let's look, for example, at the fermion masses here. The bare quark masses and the lepton masses, so the electron and muon and the tau on here. On the log scale, they look pretty evenly spaced out on a log scale. They don't look very evenly spaced, evenly spaced out on a linear scale. So, Together with the, my co-conspirators here, John Donahue, Kaushik Gupta, and Andrea Ross, what we did was we tested the hypothesis that these were drawn from various probability distributions. So we tried, for instance, a power law with an arbitrary slope delta and truncated at the low end to, be, to, to not be uh, divergent. So we did, here's the Kolmogorov Smirnov test they did. Just take all these nine numbers and plot the fraction of all these lepton masses that are below or you call a couple things that are below certain values. So you get a staircase like this, where each step in the staircase corresponds to one of the masses. Okay? And um, this is a log scale here, so if you have a uniform distribution in the log, a scale invariant probability distribution, then you would expect this to be, when I come from a distribution like this, you can shift the lower endpoint of your distribution, and you get these other curves here. And then you can use a common gorilla smeared test to see if the actual staircase departs more than it should from, from the prediction. If you change the power law, then it won't be give you a straight line for the cumulative distribution in the log here. It'll curve down like this or curve up like that. And what you see from just staring at this is actually this really looks like it's drawn from a scale invariant distribution. Pretty good approximation. And moreover, you can say something about what the lower cutoff seems to be. It doesn't seem like the staircase is kind of bending either this way or this way very much. And uh, when we did, did the math, both with this Kolmogorov-Smirnov test and with the likelihood analysis, we got that the power law, which would be minus one here for scale invariant, we can measure to be minus 1.02 plus minus 8%, which is consistent with minus one, right? So it's better than 10%. It looks like scale invariant. In cosmology, when we measure the power spectrum, it seems to be near scale invariant. It's actually telling us something. Maybe it's suggesting that Alan is right, and um, maybe it's suggesting something else. And maybe this here also is trying to give us some kind of clue. 
what the clue is, I don't know, but, but I think the numbers actually do, are saying something. I don't think it's a coincidence that you can fit this with a power law, which just happens to be scale invariant. The lower cutoff can't be absolutely anything. It, um, 10 to minus 7 or so is what the numbers tend to prefer for the, for the lower cutoff. And um, that might be telling us something too. I have two minutes left, so I thought I'd tell you something tangentially related, which I think is interesting too. The uh, effort that most man hours and woman hours have gone into so far for trying to predict these kind of numbers is the string theory and the string theory landscape. So there, string theory has this big embarrassment that it hasn't been able to make any testable predictions for anything, right? And inflation has this big embarrassment that we have to put the inflaton potential in by hand. So I have this idea that maybe if we combine these two embarrassments, they will annihilate and go away. And maybe we can actually take some specific string theory models and see if they'll inflate and see what they predict. And uh, the first thing we had to do in this project was learn enough string theory to strip away all the jargon and, and turn it into math. So here's a stringlish to English dictionary that you'll find in, the, in this paper. It's uh, actually online in this paper. Mark Kurtzberg, my student, is the first author, and Shaman Kashu and Wally Taylor are also guilty of this. And once we had converted, stripped off all the string jargon, you know, all you get are these functions, which are infoton potentials. This is for a type 2a model, which, uh, never mind what all these symbols mean, it's just, a, it's just a function of 14 variables. You can plot these. These are infoton potentials. My idea was that uh, even though it's known to be hard to inflate in string theory, if you have 10 to the 500 chance to roll the dice, or even infinitely many, as in this case, once in a while you get lucky, right? So my idea was we would numerically search for, for potentials which inflated, and then we would see what they predicted for constants of nature. Turned out, I was completely wrong. We tried and tried and tried, and we couldn't find anything that inflated at all in this broad class. And then, finally, we were able to prove this no-go theorem, which said that basically the entire class of models we were looking at, which is the best understood class of type 2 string theories, a failed inflate. They all gave a uh, slow roll parameter epsilon bigger than 27 thirteenths. And this is, you don't have to be less than one to inflate. It doesn't matter what you put in for your, for what kind of a you know, manifold you use, or what NSNS3 form fluxes you throw in, or what remote and remote fluxes, or the G6 brains. It didn't help. So this, this doesn't prove that you can't inflate a string theory, of course. But I think it actually, this kind of stuff helps make it more predictable, because most of this enormous landscape doesn't inflate. You have a more predictable theory. And the first cut and try to prune down these things is probably to see whether they inflate. And before we criticize string theorists for predicting too many explanations for what we see, we should remember that the number of explanations so far that give inflation and fit these standard model parameters is still zero, still less than one. So, still hope for some predictability. Thanks. <laughs>